Hi, I'm Rick Halk, Chief Probation Officer for the District of Columbia, and you're watching Perspectives on the FJTN. Hello and welcome to Perspectives. I'm Robin Rowland. On today's show, we're looking forward to the future, checking what's on the horizon for officers and for the national system as a whole. First, we'll explore our high-tech future with visits to New York Southern to see a defendant database system that's on the leading edge, and to Virginia Eastern to look at their innovative regional drug lab. We'll get some supervision tips from cybercrime expert Ed Harrison and we'll continue our coverage of the 2000 National Chiefs Conference, where chiefs gathered to plan the future of the system in the 21st century. In a special follow-up discussion, we'll get to the heart of what all that futures planning might mean for officers, and we'll sit down with a key player in the futures planning process, John Hughes of the FCSD. David Adair returns to talk about the legal perspective and we'll have an update on the new guideline amendments from the Sentencing Commission and news from us at the FJC. There's a lot happening on the technological front that's of interest to officers. One development that's starting to attract attention is the subject of today's first story. It's a computerized database system that's won praise from everyone who's used it, even if they used to hate computers. And no wonder. It was custom built for officers and staff. Here's our report. Hi, Doris. Oh, well, hi. How I are you? I have one prisoner for you. Oh, okay. Do you have the 312 and my fingerprint card? I sure do. It's 312. a daily occurrence in any pretrial yeah. services office around do the country. Federal agents bring defendants to intake for processing. For you don't have a social security number, huh? But what happens next only happens in the Southern District of New York. Look straight ahead, please, at the camera. As soon as a case comes in, uh, a case number is assigned and the defendant is photographed. Okay, thank you. At that point, uh, the case file is generated in Hudson. It automatically starts a case file. Hudson is an online database system developed here at New York Southern's pretrial services office. It's a river of shared knowledge that flows throughout this office, linking everyone in it. John, is this correct? You were born 82865? Yes. A defendant's case file in Hudson is a comprehensive source of information. Biographical data, addresses and phone numbers, chronos, the defendant's check-in and drug test schedule, test results, officer notes, defense attorney and AUSA names and numbers, anything that can help in managing the case. For a district like New York Southern, it's a blessing. We're a large urban district here. We're one of the largest uh, pretrial districts in the United States. We have an incredibly large intake of persons, and it seemed that we were never able to have a sufficient number of persons to cover the duties that we had lined up for ourselves. Hudson streamlines tasks for everyone in the office. Here in reception, for example, where defendants check in for their office visits, Thanks to the intake photo, the receptionist can confirm the defendant himself has come in. He fills out a brief form with his current address and phone. She checks them against the information in the case file. She can see if the supervision officer wishes to see him or if he requires a drug test. If he does, the test results are sent automatically into his case file in Hudson. So that an officer, while they're preparing their report uh, within I'd say 15 or 20 minutes of the UA being taken has a result on his PC. It also gives you an email telling you what the result is. Officers use it uh, to input chronos. Once they're entered, they're accessible by that officer from his home, from outside of the office, or from here in the office. The whole process started when we decided that we're not going to put uh, chronos onto a piece of paper anymore. We're going to uh, put into a standard database format. With uh, the database format, you get to uh, do things like uh, see patterns and um, count activities. If at any time I want to measure how, uh, how many persons are under supervision for a given period, 
the system allows me to do that. If I want to know how many people are under uh, random drug testing, I can find out. Hudson is built to work on a standard web browser, easy to learn and use. It also means officers can access Hudson from their home computers. And with a password, other districts can access Hudson over the Internet. Sharon Regis remembers what it was like to find a piece of needed information in the days before Hudson. A lot of searching. We had to go through, you know, find the folder, make sure, you know, see if the information is there. You look up, look, look. Many times you can't find the exact information. With Hudson, we put that information in and it's available online immediately. Don't expect to find a program so perfectly tailored to pretrial services at your local computer store. The genius behind Hudson is Corey Nguyen, the office's systems manager. Without doubt, Corey's a gifted programmer, but it could be that his primary talent is listening. One of our latest features is the ability to click on a client's address and uh, one, get the map of the area, a graphical map, and the second one is um, clicking on the address again to get driving directions from the court location to the client's house. Um, this was not ideas I thought of. It was the officer's uh, um, idea of what the system should do for them that, that guided me towards this, uh, these two features. Corey, he's granted us anything we wanted on it. And he keeps asking us, do you, what else do you want? Just tell me, and I'll give it to you. It's a living system that can be changed and altered and tweaked and updated constantly to meet our needs. Officers asked Corey to combine PACT's information with Hudson. They got it. They also got one-click access to docket sheets. Once again, an another officer came to me and asked, um, hey, is there a way where we can get the docket without having to go to the docket system and type that uh, docket number in and then wait for it to come back? Why can't we just click on a docket number and it pops up? Well, I found out a way to do that, and with cooperation from the clerk's office, we were able to make docket sheets available at a point and a click away. Officers here don't hesitate to recommend Hudson to others. A system like Corey's, if not Corey's, could be of equal benefit to, uh, to the pretrial offices across the country. Uh, we are currently talking about exporting Hudson to other districts, and we're beginning with our neighboring district, the Eastern District of New York, and hopefully even beyond that. Anybody who doesn't have it should take a close look, because it's really a pretty good tool. Hudson, it has helped us a lot. For Perspectives, I'm Craig Bowden. We were able to show you only a fraction of the features that Corey has built into Hudson, most of them at officer request. It truly is an amazing tool. We continue our report on technology with a caution to officers and some solutions. The subject is cybercrime, and our guide is Ed Harrison. He says that in a supervision situation, officers may need to think globally and act locally. The thing that has made it incredibly difficult is that internet connectivity has gotten to the point where you can almost access something off the internet as fast as you can access it off your hard drive. So why should you keep images that could be incriminating to you on your hard drive when you could keep them in a hard drive in a jurisdiction that's not going to order, uh, uh, not going to recognize a search order? So you need to understand with the sex offenders especially, and some, more and more of the economic criminals are doing this as well, something called data caching. That is simply putting your data in another jurisdiction out of the way so that if you do come and do a search on someone's house and on their computer, you're not going to find anything because it's on a hard drive in the Virgin Islands or in Guam or in the Philippines or some other place on the planet. You're not going to find it. There are some jurisdictions that are able to, through court orders, um, get the offender to actually install software on a computer that will um, take snapshots of what's going on on that computer and email it to the officer so the officer can see what's going on. It doesn't take a, a highly skilled officer to get one of these emails and say, oh, that's pornography, or oh, that's credit card information, or oh, that's... So that software is certainly something that's out there. It would be extremely valuable to the, 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 the probation officer doing the supervision that there would be a specific court order that the defendant provide periodic copies of the phone records, 
The same with credit reports, charge card statements, anything that would show interaction uh, with money or telephones or internet service. There's a lot more great information from Ed Harrison on the FJC's recent special needs offenders broadcast on cybercrime. It's one you don't want to miss, so if you haven't seen it yet, check your FJT and bulletin for rebroadcast times. Coming up next on Perspectives, we'll reveal the outcome of the futures planning process at the Chiefs Conference and join a discussion on the results that officers might see. And FCSD Chief John Hughes talks about his views on the future of the system. There's a lot more to come, so please stay with us. Substance abuse issues play a major part in supervising defendants and offenders. Now, probation and pretrial services officers can get the latest information directly from national experts. This is among the most complex phenomena facing our society today. Live on the FJTN, the Federal Judicial Center presents Substance Abuse, a continuing education series which brings you the latest on research, policy, and strategies. Check the FJTN Bulletin or the JNET for air dates of the next edition of this provocative series. In our last edition of Perspectives, we went to the 2000 National Chiefs Conference in San Antonio where chiefs were called on to shape the future of the probation and pretrial services system. In a special timeline, series of workshops led by facilitator Faye Mullaney, they started by looking at the are, past to discover the values that make their districts what they are. The two things you voted for out of that timeline that were most important to you was impartiality and equal administration of justice and that people can change fundamental things. You then uh, were asked to think about what makes you proud. What we're proud of is we can make a difference. And then when I asked what your sorries were, you said the thing you're sorriest about is indifference, complacency. Next, so they scanned the present the horizon to identify the forces arrayed force against them. And out of those, the one that you said was the most powerful, impacting force that was pushing on your life now was the call for accountability. We put the next screen up and asked you, of all the forces impacting you, which one do you feel you can grab by the horns and do something about? And what was the highest vote getter? Accountability. In fact, you said, the greatest force pushing on us is the one we can do something about. It was a remarkable display of strength and solidarity, and they weren't even finished. In the last stage of their journey, the question was, what kind of system do we want in the future? Not an easy question, as Mark Maggio reports. Before they could decide what kind of system they wanted in the future, chiefs first had to agree on what a system is. What are the traits of a system? What are the benefits of a system? And, sorry, but what are the costs? Ain't going to be any free lunch to have a good system. Fortunately, the workshops had prepped them for that question with time devoted to this value spectrum, a roadmap built on choices. Through their ratings on eight system values, chiefs mapped out the future they sought, and that map called for a change of direction. And it's unusual that in a a group like this, that seven of the eight items would call for significant movement. Again, not a worshiping of the status quo, if that is any indication, but a recognition that you know there's places yet to go. The chiefs embraced consultation and consensus building over centralized directive style decision making. They showed they would sacrifice a small amount of local flexibility to achieve greater national uniformity. They chose to move from a largely independent system toward a more interdependent one, and showed a strong preference for collaboration over coordination. On the traditional balance point between law enforcement and treatment, chiefs felt the system needed to move back toward treatment. Their strongest mandate was to shift work focus from activities toward outcomes and to base efforts more in the community 
then in the office. Finally, they chose to move toward a greater identity with the national system than with their local court. With their map in place, Mullaney helped the chiefs fill in the details of the system they desired, acknowledging its traits, its benefits, and its cost. Which trait needs the attention of federal probation and pretrial services? It's kind of like if the car has a lot of good working parts, let's don't, let's don't focus on those. What things need attention to make sure this vehicle carries us forward? Okay. Whoa. So a real sense that uh, the first thing we need to do is get the destination right. Okay. Um, what about the benefits? Let's take a look at those. We expect all of these benefits out of a system. Which is the most important benefit to you? So again, an end product kind of focus uh, is what really benefits the most, and just a sense of uh, that we aren't in this alone. Okay, finally, the last one has to do <coughs> with the cost. That's the other flip side of this whole thing of system building is it, it ain't free. It comes with a price. That's always painful. The accountability for outcome won't come easily. We'd rather report our activity than our outcome. So what does the future look like? The chief's vision was summed up in five goal statements. They called for a system in which desired outcomes are clear and measured and results are communicated. A system whose components cooperate to deliver an effective continuity of services. One that successfully serves the whole through collaboration and communication. Chiefs favor a system in which supervision is moving from the office to the community, and in which staff share a commitment to mission and to the treatment of all persons with dignity and respect. With their work complete and their vision clear in their minds, these chiefs left the conference eager to share their journey with their districts, and perhaps dedicated to a measured yet determined course of change. Dick Gregory, a comedian uh, who was active during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, once said that revolutions uh, never start on the street with the picket line. Revolutions always start inside our heads. And so just perhaps this week, a quiet revolution uh, has begun. For Perspectives, I'm Mark Maggio. And what about that quiet revolution? What kinds of results should officers expect? We invited four chiefs to our studios for a roundtable discussion about those issues. After we look in on that, we'll hear from a key personality in the future's planning process, John Hughes, Chief of the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division. But first, to the four chiefs. We asked them to start with practical things that officers can do to strengthen their bond to the national system. I'm uh, really interested in pushing an old concept that I was taught 25 years ago when I entered the system, and that was you do the same quality of work for your fellow officer across the country as you would do for your own judge. And I think that's a very important goal that the system should get really back to. And I think sometimes when we're talking on the national level, we're talking about working well with the administrative office, the federal judicial center, the sentencing commission. Bureau of prisons. Bureau of prisons. But, you know, sometimes I think we forget that it starts on our own doorstep in our own district mm -hmm. because we know that in several instances there's competition and problems in our own district between probation, pretrial services, and we need to overcome that at the local level in order to be effective because we are a continuum of services and we really need to work with each other locally as well as nationally. And more TDYs. Yes. And the TDYs provide such a wonderful experience for people to, mm -hmm. uh, to help out another district, mm -hmm. uh, to see another side of our system, perhaps different kinds of cases. Yes, absolutely. I think one of the, I've never <coughs> been on the receiving end of TDY, but I did one and it was one of the best experiences I'd ever had. It was something that really helped my career. It, it encouraged me that I could look beyond my district for opportunities, for learning experiences. So, it's so I think when officers look in news and views, 
they ought to look at those requests for temporary duty and they ought to think, well, is that something I might do or my, I might learn from? It's a way of yes. getting involved. There's lots of other ways as, as well. Um, even just calling a, another district and asking them for their policy on, a, on, mm -hmm. on some issue, whether it be uh, awards programs or informant policy or the new drug testing policy, mm -hmm. um, is a way of, of mm -hmm. uh, bridging the gaps between the districts mm -hmm. and finding that there's a lot of wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful work that's going on across the country. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed. Uh, when we, whenever we reach out mm -hmm. uh, for policies, how, how good the work is across the country. And most of our officers do come in with that sense of expectation and pride. I had one officer who was not a U.S. pretrial services officer. She was a United States pretrial services officer. And she made that very clear, <laughs> no matter where she introduced herself. It was not U.S., it was United States. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the rest of us always introduced ourselves in the same manner. Uh, the, the officers um, in the community are the ones that represent the federal probation system. They are, across, across the country, how many officers they are and how many folks do they come in contact with uh, over the course of a year. They are the federal probation system. Um, and I, I think that it's very important um, because to, for officers to realize that collectively their actions, uh, their comments, what they do mm -hmm. is that persona, you know, makes that mm -hmm. persona. And we talked about the need to maintain a system and it's a point of pride for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and what folks can do in order to help preserve that sense of system while we still maintain the autonomy and the creativity of our, of our districts. And, and some of it, as we talked about yesterday, was speak about our system with pride. Mm -hmm. um, avoid cynicism. Mm -hmm. you know, work towards mm -hmm. uh, results. Think about performance out outcomes, offender outcomes, or mm -hmm. defendant court outcomes mm -hmm. uh, in their work. Uh, it kind of gets us back to where we started about uh, being professional with each other and working together. But when you think in terms of uh, the fact that all the officers across the country have been selected from a pool of very competent, mm -hmm. talented people, you think about the fact that they have all undergone extensive background mm -hmm. investigations, the character, integrity, and values that they bring to the system and that you know that you can stand aside of people of that caliber mm -hmm. who are committed and dedicated professionals is, uh, has really been a great joy to me. And mm -hmm. I think the more that we can foster and continue that level of professionalism, uh, the better served our system will be mm -hmm. uh, in, in the years to come. I think when we left the chief's meeting, there was pretty much uniformly a feeling of positive um, excitement for the future and I think mm -hmm. that stemmed from sort of a collaboration on, on an agreement that we're going to work in the future together in a, a way to pull ourselves I think together more as a system. Um, we've all, there's all, change is a constant but I think we're in a transition and, and the, I think collectively the chiefs all agreed mm -hmm that we want to pull together and make it um, a better system nationally. And the challenge we have is, is to try to filter that, that concept um, amongst the entire system mm -hmm. and the ranks. Mm -hmm. uh, that really, I think, uh, is the challenge to get everybody uh, on board so we can actually carry it out, because we can't do it. Yeah. It's really not us, it's, yeah. it's everyone. Yeah. Well, you got the best and brightest. <laughs> No one is better placed to talk about the future of the federal probation and pretrial services system than our next guest. John Hughes is chief of the administrative office's Federal Corrections and Supervision Division. In that role, not only does he guide the nationwide administration of the system, but he's also on the front lines of supporting and improving the working life of officers. Welcome, John. Thank you. 
We're going to put you on the spot first thing by asking you to talk a little bit about yourself. A lot of officers out there don't know your history. For example, that you've been both a federal probation and pretrial services officer. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, it is true that I, I have been both. I was sworn in in New York Eastern as a pretrial services officer way back in the 70s and came to the AO about the time that the Pretrial Services Act of 82 was being implemented and I was hired as a pretrial services specialist at the AO to help implement that law, to do some training and to do data collection and certain things. And I stayed for the next 14 or 15 years and migrated to different positions at the AO. I've been a regional administrator and I've been a uh, branch chief in each of the three branches at the division. And uh, around 1988, I uh, moved upstairs at the AO to a position in the Office of Management Coordination where I got a bird's eye view of the AO and got to learn more about how that works. But then an opportunity came up to be a Deputy Chief Probation Officer out in Arizona. I saw the ad for it and I talked my wife and four kids into uh, letting me apply for it and we went west. And it was a great opportunity to work again in a court and it's a special office out there. There are a lot of good people in that office who work very hard and are committed to the, to the job and, and to making a difference. And it was good to be around people like that in the courts again, you know, with defendants yeah. coming through the back door and buses pulling up and marshals around. And it felt good to be back in the court after all those years. So you really do have a wide range of knowing the AO inside and out and then having been an officer in different offices, different parts of the country, too. I did feel like, after all that experience, that when this opportunity arose for this job, that I, it was a chance of a lifetime and I had to try for it. But I felt like I was ready. Mm -hmm. Do you miss the field? I do. There's a lot about working in the field, in the so-called real world, that, that I do miss. But it, it helps to know that we're serving those people here and to be reminded as often as we can that what we're doing here is in support of their efforts out in the field. So that helps. John, at the National Chiefs Conference, you told a story about your pride in, in being a part of the federal probation and pretrial services system. Would you share that with us now? Well, it's a, a little bit corny, but I will share it. Uh, when I got the job back in New York Eastern, I was still in my 20s, and I was feeling pretty proud to have become a Fed. I mean, my parents are first-generation Americans, and they were very impressed that, you know, I'd get a job with the federal government and work for the federal courts of all places. And, and I was so proud that I actually went out and bought a trench coat because I guess <laughs> I thought that's what you're supposed to look like. And it was the real deal with buttons and, and all kinds of things on it and a big belt. And, <laughs> and I walked around Brooklyn like that for a while until one day I walked in a county probation office and walked up to a desk and there was a guy behind the desk who said, let me guess, a fed. <laughs> so at that point I, I had a little insight into what I looked like and the code ended up in Salvation Army. But, uh, but the point of the story was uh, the pride I had uh, continues to this day and all the jobs mm -hmm. I've had, it, it's always good to say where I work. I, I still feel very proud of that. Yeah. And especially in this job, to have a chance to serve the system from this level is a, a great opportunity. Speaking of the Chiefs Conference, it's been almost six months since it happened. Mm -hmm. Many attendees feel that that was a watershed event for the system. and one that sparked a long-term process of positive change. In your view, what are the most important outcomes so far? Well, I think you're right that it, it did spark a long-term result, but, you know, we're only six months into it, and we, but we already can feel that it's a long-term result. There was so much commitment shown by those chiefs, some of whom have been around a long time, and you might expect them to be a little bit more cynical or, or at least pessimistic about changing the, the behavior of offenders, for example. But one of the things, they, they had these, these items they could vote for. Uh, and one of the things most chiefs could agree with was that people can change and that probation and pretrial services officers can make a difference. And that was pretty impressive. It sounds simple, 
But to have people who have been around for a long time saying that that's still true and they're still committed to that was very invigorating for, for all in attendance. And, and it left us all with a good feeling. And building on that feeling, I think we're, we're you know, follow up to the Chiefs Conference, there's a lot of groups that are working on various aspects of, of that conference to follow up on it. But we're, we're setting the table also for a strategic assessment of the whole system which will begin very shortly. And that will involve a lot of roundtable discussions about what the system is all about, who we should be in the future, and that sort of thing. And it was very encouraging that at the Chiefs Conference that those kinds of ideas just flew. People just grabbed them and ran with them. The, it was, they were very happy to t talk about these things, uh, and we really tapped into something. So I think the timing could not be better, that uh, the strategic assessment is beginning now following that Chiefs Conference. That's great. Um, John, in what direction would you personally like to see the system move over the next five years? In the direction that started at the Chiefs Conference, I think, and that is a move towards greater collaboration, working together to solve problems. The insight we got at that conference was that there's a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge in our system, and that we need to pool ideas, we need to share and we need to do it together. And we're already doing that in many areas, but we've, we're going to expand on that. We already have working groups on officer safety, on sex offender treatment, on Indian country. That's a very special population that's been neglected for too long. We have a working group on pretrial detention, getting back to the basics of pretrial services, why it was started in the first place. In February of this year, the director approved a ad hoc supervision working group which is an umbrella group that has five groups underneath it and they're looking at all kinds of uh, supervision issues which is our bread and butter which we better pay attention to and they're looking at transitional issues from prison to the community technical violation policy uh, treatment in a risk control environment pretrial services supervision and also performance measures but the point I'm making is that it's a collaborative effort. These are people from the courts working with people at the AO and at the FJC. Uh, we have the FJC at the table with us. If there, is, if there is an implementation issue or a training issue that arises, they're right there to help us through it. And it's really been a great experience for us to, to work together so closely and to put our ideas together. John, thanks for talking with us. Oh, you're quite welcome. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Michael Burney, your host for Court to Court. Our mission is to provide education and information that will enhance your job and how the courts function. What ongoing challenges do you face each day? What innovative practices are other districts applying? What makes your work satisfying? We'll find these stories and share them with you. We're excited about what's in store. Be sure to watch Court to Court on the FJTN. Check the FJTN Bulletin or the JNET for broadcast dates and time. Welcome back. Perspectives likes to focus on local innovations that resolve problems and create new opportunities. And that's definitely the case with our next story from the Eastern District of Virginia. As Kate Linett reports, some out-of-the-box thinking in their pretrial services office, combined with a quest for perfection, have benefited officers throughout the region. I've worked in a forensic and toxicology lab for many years. And in my experiences in the lab, you see a lot of adulterated urines and you sort of know what to look for. And I noticed that we were getting a lot of uh, diluted looking samples. At Virginia Eastern's pretrial services office, they knew a water diluted urine sample could mean a defendant's drug use might go undiscovered. And that wasn't the only problem spot in the drug testing program. If you have somebody that tested positive today and it takes you a week or two to get the result back, you can have a week or two of drug use by that person without you being able to do anything about it. Elements of doubt about his test results did not sit well with Bob Claggett, Virginia Eastern's lab technician, a man with a perfectionist streak. Well, I asked the chief about it. maybe if we could get a better analyzer, something that could test for a creatinine. A test of a sample's creatinine level is sometimes the only way to confirm whether it's been diluted. But to do creatinine testing requires a high volume analyzer, 
and the district wasn't doing enough testing to justify one. At that point, inspiration struck, and Chief Carolyn Ortwine got on the phone. And she called me in uh, 1998 and asked if we would be interested in contributing uh, urines to the uh, cause of a regional drug lab with the thought that we'd save money, process drug uh, or urine screens a lot faster. We thought it would be a wonderful idea if we, um, if we did the testing for the other two court units and even treatment facilities where specimens are collected because we could have the increased volume. That would qualify us for a larger analyzer. The idea took root and soon Virginia Eastern's pretrial services was in business with the country's only district-run regional drug lab. We have samples coming in from the D.C. Probation Office, Alexandria Probation Office, Manassas Office of Probation, and the pretrial services here in Alexandria and from Richmond, Virginia. Presently, we are testing just about 100,000 tests a year. The plan benefits everyone. With high volume have come lower costs and quicker turnaround. We get a turnaround from Carolyn's shop in about 24 hours, as opposed to about two weeks with the National Lab. We also save money. Uh, we save about $3.75 for every sample that uh, Carolyn's uh, people test and uh, return to us. But it's not only the new analyzer that makes the district's testing program state-of-the-art. Other procedures, born of Bob Claggett's years of experience, offer yet more sophisticated tools to officers. We're the only district in the country that uses creatinine to determine if two marijuana results are new use or just a reflection of previous use by the defendant. Can you check us for specific gravity? In many cases, Virginia Eastern's own supervision officers can get immediate results. It's, it's been a wonderful um, supervision tool for both pretrial services and probation. You have a person right there on the spot that has over 30 years experience in uh, testing urines and testing for drugs. So you have the ability to go ask that person uh, what he thinks of this specimen. Smell good, Daryl. Smell good. Two, yeah. one point zero zero one. Okay, thanks. Future plans for the lab include a more sophisticated, higher speed analyzer and immediate desktop access to test results for officers and treatment counselors. But technical wizardry aside, there's another reason the regional drug lab represents the wave of the future. The conversations we had at the National Chiefs uh, Conference this past summer had to do with how do we, in a decentralized environment, uh, become a national system, uh, learn to cooperate, to depend on each other, to communicate across uh, districts, and, and even between units within a district. And this is a perfect example of how you go about doing that. A person comes up with a good idea, follows through on it, and other people cooperate. It just happened to be our office um, who identified the need and uh, got the group together. It could be certainly any uh, court unit that had a compelling need in a good geographic area. Um, anyone can certainly do it. For Perspectives, I'm Kate Linett. Chief Ortwine says a big key to their success is having a dedicated lab technician like Bob Claggett. Just having an experienced person in that position, she says, brings subject matter expertise and a sense of scientific credibility to their drug testing operations including on the witness stand. David Adair joins us now with his update on the legal perspective. Welcome back, David. Hi, Robin. I'm glad to be here. I understand you have something a bit unusual and far afield for us this time. Yes, I have. Although it's been a quiet couple of months here, um, with few developments of note in the legal area, there have been a few frequently asked questions. And believe it or not, one of these has been about the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Now, Article 36 of that convention, of which the United States is a member, provides that consular officials of an arrested alien state of origin must be allowed to communicate with the arrestee. Now, this occurs principally when the arrestee is in, in confinement. If the arrestee asks, 
the competent authority of the arresting state is required to inform the consular post of the arrestee's country of origin of the arrest and detention. A number of pretrial services officers have asked if they have any responsibility to advise an alien defendant of his or her rights under the convention. Now, the treaty does not impose specific obligations on officers or employees of the, judici of the judiciary. In fact, the State Department has advised that judicial officials are not responsible for notification and that the responsibility is usually on the part of the law enforcement officer who makes the arrest or who, who assumes responsibility for an alien's detention. The State Department has, however, encouraged judicial officers who preside over arraignments or other initial appearances to inquire whether the alien has been provided with consular notification. And though there is no suggestion that pretrial services officers have any obligation to either provide or verify notification, there's also nothing to prevent a judicial branch officer or employee from providing assistance. So if your court wants you to provide this kind of assistance, I suggest that you may want to seek help from the United States Attorney's Office for guidance on any of the details, such as the timing of the notice. Hmm. Have there been any frequently asked questions that might be of interest to supervision officers? Well, there's an oldie but goodie, one that's been asked over the years but was uh, recently um, asked again. And that is, what is the responsibility of a probation officer to prevent an offender who's under the influence of drugs or alcohol from driving? Now, this question arises in the situation which, uh, during an office visit, an offender appears to have been using drugs or alcohol. Now, I do believe that an officer has some responsibility here. But since the Criminal Law Committee has disapproved of officers making arrests, officers should not act to physically restrain such an offender. Nonetheless, there are a lot of other things that an officer can do. For example, an officer might attempt to coax the offender to voluntarily give up the keys to the car. Or an offender may be instructed to remain in the office until the effect of the substance is dissipated. The officer might call a family member to take the offender home, or depending on the circumstances, to a detox center even. Or a taxi cab could be called for the offender. Now, if the offender insists on leaving the office and the officer believes that the offender is likely to drive, the officer should simply warn the offender that local law enforcement will be notified, and then the officer should follow up on that. Law enforcement can then take any action they can to intercept the defendant. And I know a number of probation offices have had good results with this procedure. In other words, Robin, uh, officers simply need to use professional judgment and common sense in dealing with this situation. Yes, I'm sure they will, and you've given us a lot of options to consider. What about the Supreme Court's Apprendi decision? Have there been any new developments there? Well, you're speaking, of course, of Apprendi versus New Jersey, uh, in which the Supreme Court held that facts other than prior convictions that increase a sentence beyond the statutory maximum must be pled by the government and found beyond a reasonable doubt. The answer to your question is that there have been quite a few cases, and a few, but by no means all, issues seem to be settled. Uh, for example, most quote, courts are holding that Apprendi does not require that facts relevant to sentencing guideline determinations, as opposed to sentencing uh, or as, as opposed to statutory sentence determinations, be pled and proved beyond a reasonable doubt. It also seems clear that in drug cases, at least, the principles of, of Apprendi are not implicated so long as the sentence imposed is within the maximum sentence that could have been imposed without reference to drug quantity. In most cases under Section 841, that's 20 years, unless, of course, there's a prior conviction. And it seems likely that prosecutors will be pleading drug quantities from now on. But there's still many, many unresolved issues, particularly in connection with cases in which the indictment or information was filed and the trial or plea taken before the Apprendi decision. Until these questions are resolved, I'm still suggesting that pre-sentence writers need only flag the issue for the court in these cases. For now, it should be up to the parties to present the issues to the court to decide. We'll continue to follow the decision and try to get you guidance uh, when it's clear how officers uh, should react to this difficult decision. Good information as usual, David. Thanks again. Thank you. In news of interest on our regular FYI segment, we'll begin with events at the U.S. Sentencing Commission. In October, the Commission's third symposium on federal sentencing policy focused on current sentencing for economic crimes and on ways new technologies have impacted the landscape of criminal activity. The event was an opportunity for the Commission to gather input on those issues. 
Attendees heard from representatives from the federal legal community and from academia and industry. You can watch all or part of the symposium from your desktop via webcast. Just follow the links on the Sentencing Commission's website at www.ussc.gov. In other Commission news, November 1st was the effective date for 13 new amendments to the sentencing guidelines. These amendments focus on congressional interest issues, circuit conflicts, and technical issues. Two previous emergency amendments relating to the No Electronic Theft Act and Telemarketing Fraud Prevention Act were made permanent by the Commission. Congressional interest issues also resulted in changes to methamphetamine, firearms, child pornography and sexual abuse, identity theft, and phone cloning guidelines. The Commission also resolved five circuit conflicts during this amendment cycle, three relating to departure issues. They amended departure provisions concerning post-sentencing rehabilitation, aberrant behavior, and dismissed or uncharged conduct. They also resolved circuit conflicts regarding the application of the guideline for drug trafficking in protected locations and a specific offense characteristic under the guideline dealing with bankruptcy fraud. And the Commission made a couple of technical corrections, amending the guideline on unlawful chemicals to fix a typographical error and including a new sex offender provision as a specific mandatory condition of probation and supervised release rather than as a footnote. For more information on the 2000 amendments, call the Commission's helpline at 202-502-4545 or check out their website. In a program co-produced with the Sentencing Commission, the FJC presents the latest in its Special Needs Offenders series. The broadcast highlights the Sex Offender Treatment Program at the Federal Correctional Institution at Butner, North Carolina, and features excerpts from a June 2000 seminar that engaged nearly 100 probation and pretrial services officers in a question and answer session. The program debuts December 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Officers wishing a deeper understanding of the Apprendi decision should tune in for a new program dealing with the issues and questions surrounding that subject. Charging and Sentencing After Apprendi airs for the first time December 13th. And if you find yourself challenged by change in your workplace, a new PBS program called Managing Personal Change may help you turn change to your advantage. The program airs December 14th and may be used for two hours of group credit in the Supervisor's Development Program. Coming up, we'll get an advanced look at the next edition of Perspectives. But first, please stay tuned for this important announcement. Oh, and please feel free to sing along. I'm an evaluation form. You've surely seen me before. Well, I'm part of your materials and I perform a vital chore. Well, the information in me helps the center to take stock. It helps them make their programs work to help you do your job. Please fill me in. Please fill me in. Oh, we need this information. Please fill me in. Please fill me in. Oh, we need to know the score. Please fill me in. Please fill me in. Your feedback is important. And if you don't complete this form, we'll sing this song again. Your feedback is important. Please fill in the evaluation form available in your program materials or online on the DCN. Yes, we'll remind you once again to fill out that friendly little evaluation form and send it to us here at the FJC. A copy is available from your site coordinator or you can fill it out online. Just head for the DCN address on the screen. On the next edition of Perspectives, We'll discover how officers are getting involved in their communities, often with inspiring results. And as usual, we'll have plenty of news, views, and great ideas from the field and from the nation's capital. That's it for our show today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time. For all of us here at Perspectives, I'm Robin Rowland. 
Goodbye.